Welcome everybody to the New Fly Fisher. I'm your host, Colin McEwen. In today's show, we're going down the South Fork of the Snake River. I'm really excited about this. This is one of the first times I've gone down here. I'm going out with Jack and Zach Parker, who are very familiar and experienced on this river. We're gonna be talking about fly fishing on the top and getting big brown trout, big cutthroat, and big rainbows. It's gonna be a real exciting show. I know you're gonna enjoy this. Stay with us. One of the most beautiful places in the American West is the South Fork of the Snake River. Located a few hours outside of Idaho Falls in Idaho, this meandering river is incredible. It possesses unbelievable natural splendor and incredible fishing. Today I have the pleasure of doing a drift down the snake with Jack Parker and his son Zach. Jack is the National Sales Manager for Clackercraft which is one of the leading manufacturers of drift boats in North America. Jack is passionate about the Snake River and was happy to show me today why it is so special. Zach is a seasoned fly fishing guide who works for South Fork Outfitters. Zach has been described as an extremely patient teacher who possesses an enthusiasm that can only be described as contagious for all things related to fly fishing on the Snake. Both Jack and Zach share a wonderful bond with the river and as a father and son. I felt truly privileged to spend a day with them as they taught me more about the fishing here. Zach, could you explain a little bit about what you tell everybody that comes here for the first time? What I like to tell people, if, uh, if they haven't fished in the drift boat before, I like to divide the boat up in half at the oar. The guy in the back half, he has to be the responsible one for the guy in the front. What happens, the guy in the front, you're casting into shore, you're pounding the banks, and he's not really paying attention to what the guy in the back's doing. So the man in the back, he has to make sure they're not going to be casting at the same time, not tangling up, not causing messes. So that's, that's the rules I like to start out with in the boat. Um, what we talk about also, we have a lot of cutthroats here. That's why the dry fly fishing is so great. They come up on a real slow rise. You'll see them coming and coming and coming up. You just have to be patient with them. The rainbows we have here and the brown trout, they'll hit it quick, just probably like the other rivers you're fishing. One thing that's become kind of a controversy lately though is the rainbow and cutthroat population. Mm -hmm. Right now on a given mile you have about a thousand cutthroats and a thousand rainbows and hybrids. And these rainbows are more aggressive and they were introduced in 1980 and what's happening is they're just out spawning and out working the cutthroats. So fishing game they're taking steps to reduce the rainbow population in order to save the cutthroats. And right now they've changed the limits from, it used to be two rainbows over 16 inches, now it's six rainbows of any size. They're talking about possibly making, changing the slot limit to 10 rainbows next year or unlimited rainbows. And they, they, do their, they do their electroshocking in the winter time and throughout the summer and they, they gather the rainbows up that they've collected and they take their measurements and the data and then they take them off to some stock ponds and leave them there. They have fish ladders in the tributaries. They're trying to prevent the rainbows to get to. But I guess the key here is that for fly fishers who are very used to catch and release, total catch and release, this is a real hard thing to make the transition to keep a couple of fish. It is. It's a real tough thing. I've had some clients who wanted to keep some rainbows this year, and and that's their choice. They have that right to. But it's a, growing up doing catch and release, seeing a rainbow in the bottom of the bucket, you know, the ice chest. That's a real tough thing to to come to terms with. But it's one of those things you have to. At least I feel you have to look at the long term effects. If the rainbows eventually just wipe out the cutthroats, then this fishery won't be the same. I mean, people come here to sit on the riffles in July and they sit here and they can catch, you know, 30 cutthroats just sitting there sipping on PMDs. And we're going to end up catching some cutthroats today and they're great. Nothing rises like a dry, to a dry fly like a cutthroat. One of the things that we notice about a lot of times this time of year, the conclave's been out here for, you know, many, many years and so I get to fish with a lot of the Easterners that are coming here for conclave. And Federation guys in particular, this is their, their hobby, their sport, their life. They like casting fly rods. It just impresses them to no end to be able to cast 70 feet of fly line. But 70 foot of fly line on 10,000 CFS of water doesn't get you a lot. It doesn't do a whole lot. 
and uh, riffle fishing in particular, the river's going to start to drop and we'll have some really good PMD fishing. And guys will bail out of the boat and stand where they ought to be casting and, you know, and then cast a long ways away. All right. What's happening, if you don't see that little yellow indicator on top, yellow and orange, yeah. give that thing a good hard twist to turn that thing over. Okay. Just like that, good. You gotta like it when they come up twice, eh? That's nice, huh? That's nice. Good. That's the thing that amazes a lot of people from the east is how close to the shore these fish will go here. Yeah. Now, and you're good right in that distance right here. Okay, because it's too shallow exactly. over there? Exactly, a little bit too shallow right there. It's going to be good distance for you. There we go. There fish go. on. Good. Fish on, fish on. All right. Now, can you twist the boat a bit to put towards the camera? Okay, now watch this suck hole here, buddy. Do you want to kind of eddy up in here before it? or? We want to pull in over here. It might be a good idea. We got that big hydraulic. For the sake of Barry. See, it's a decent fish. Yeah, it feels like a good one. That way, if you want to drop the, uh, if you want to drop the chain and uh, Jump out and net the fish over on this side with the sun. Okay. You did. We're good. Cut through. Turn off the cut through. Yep. Is that what you consider about an average size? Cut throat, or is it a little bit small? I'm gonna say it's probably a little bit smaller than normal. Okay. I don't want to. Credit that to the fishermen or anything. Well, thank you. <laughs> there you go. They have a slot limit here on the cutthroats. You can't kill any cuts between 8 and 16 inches. So you, a lot of them are in that range. In the fall, the wintertime, browns used to come up in here and spawn. It was a tremendous, tremendous bunch of brown trout reds. Yeah, typically the, the fish, like on other rivers, they, they like cover. And these rock cliffs are undercut and little cubby holes back in them and places they can hide if you get tucked back up in like that. And uh, it's just all about the cover. Also, the, these golden stones, they're, they're nocturnal and they'll come out and crawl up on the rocks at night. And so that's why we're kind of pounding the edges here trying to stir up some of that activity. And what you're going to see, I guess, then, is just you'll bang it off the rock here, and then you'll see a pair of lips come up and grab it. Exactly. Yep. Just it's going to be real, relatively fat. Oh, we will. We just want jaws. Now, these are really uh, well undercut here, these banks? Yes. So it's a lot of cover for them, eh? There's a tremendous amount of water in the river this time of year. Typically, it should be lower. Uh, the south fork of the Snake here is uh, governed by irrigation demand. During July is peak irrigation demand, and that flows somewhere up around 14,000 CFS. Uh, now the grain is about done, and they're starting to do some harvesting, so the river flows are starting to get cut back. And most years, around the 1st of August, the river drops down to about 8,000 CFS, but it's still up around 10,000 now. They're kind of ramping it down slowly. It was 14,000 uh, over the weekend. There's one rise, Zach. You see him? Okay, I'm on him. Right there, there he is. Oh, nice job. I saw him come up and rise. That's... Okay. That is a good one, I think. You need to chase him? No, nah, I think I can course him up, maybe. I don't want him down over there very bad. Well, it's a great start to the day there, Jack. I got lucky on this one. I saw him come up. Right I don't think I can here. get him back up in this current here. Get his head up out of the water. 
Great. Oh, thank you. Nice again. Bring them up here, bud. Cool. Thank you, Zach. What we want to try to do along here is fish as close to the bank as we can. Um, mm -hmm. These fish have seen an awful lot of flies. Also, the golden stones are coming out, and they're somewhat nocturnal. And they'll get up into the grass during the night, and as the sun comes out, they're still kind of lingering around there, and so the fish will move tight along the grass or the undercut, uh, the rocks, and it's just real good cover. So we always say the closer you fish to the bank, the better. Now, when you say, what, what is the zone? What's a reasonable zone to be casting into them, the bank? If you fish a foot from the shore this time of year, you won't catch very many fish. If you fish six inches from shore, you'll catch a few. But if you're bumping the grass just like that cast there was perfect, that's where you're going to catch fish. As tight as you can get it to the bank without, without hanging up. And so, so we can expect to lose a few. This is like nymphing. We're going to lose yes. a, a, yeah. a few flies today. and then. Uh, but the payoff is that this is where the fish are, and we're going to get lots of uh, browns and cutthroat Cut coming up and whacking it. Okay. No guts, no glory, they say. <laughs> okay. Let's see if we can get some down this. You're saying this side? Uh... Yeah. Okay. And every once in a while, as we're floating, too, you'll want to look, and uh, that last fish I caught, I saw him rise. Now, he was further out from shore, but there was a little pile of rocks he was hiding behind. But and what, what would they him? be rising for at this time of the day? PMDs or something? Or? Uh, he could have just been up taking the... Uh, an emerger of some sort. There's about the only thing I'm seeing on the water right now are midges. Um, haven't seen any goldens yet. But. Placement of your hopper pattern is critical when casting to structure tight to shore when trying to locate trout. Key locations on rivers like this include snags or fallen logs, overhanging trees and brush, including shadows they provide, boulders and rocks, especially combined with fallen trees or branches submerged wheat edges and shadows. And of course, the classic grassy edges with undercut banks. All trout are looking for security from predators. Undercut banks provide an ideal location for them to hide and yet stay near critical feeding lanes. Many western rivers, like the Snake, possess large areas that have undercut banks, which is why it is so critical for fly fishers to cast their fly within a foot of the bank the fish simply won't leave the security of the undercut unless it is a short distance, which will minimize their exposure to threats. Now, are you still using the same uh, fly? Yeah, Chernobyl. And... There you go. Very decent fish. Glorified white fish, big white fish. Well, we want a grand slam today, right? A chance it could be a carp. You got carp in here? Well, if there is, I can sure catch them. It's just oh, too cold up here. Oh, my lord. We might have to have a Kodak moment here, Zeke. That's oh, the brown nice of the... Brown <laughs> That's the biggest fish nice of the summer for me, brown. man. Biggest fish of the summer. Well, I'll have to give you more suggestions like that again, Jack. Colin, this is a big fish. Good stuff. Let's Coming take... your way, bud. A little green yet, I think, but... Nice fish. Oh, it is a nice fish. fish. Real nice. Oh, he didn't <laughs> like that, did he? Well, I think it's that color of shirt you have on. They like it. They're attracted to it. We know we got the clean underwear thing going. <laughs> <laughs> We've already checked. Different one thing right, Elise, huh? It's I don't like, know what it is about browns, like but a lot attention. of times they do like these slack water, and they'll just sit here and pick things going by in the fast water, especially the confused, poor little small trout that's gotten... Now, are you saying my dad's confused fisherman? No, he said, he said little. No, it's too early in the day to start pretty, saying something like that. It's pretty big to be little and confused. <laughs> okay, let's uh, I'll try to get his head up here. Now, what are you using there? You got a six weight or a five? It's a five. A five weight? Yep, five weight, four yeah. X tippet. Four X. Okay, I'm gonna get his head up and make one run at the boat if I can turn him. 
<laughs> nice <laughs> going. <laughs> Maggie, that's a good fish. That's a nice fish. That's as good a fish as I've caught all year. Congratulations. Thank you. Just toss it around, toss the fly, and I'm clear. Now, if uh, if you if you can hold it up for me, and for the. Yeah, you want to hold them here? Nope. Go ahead. You got your hands wet, and you're closer. I want to get a shot with you uh, holding it there. You can do it. Well, he was too big to get your hands around, didn't he? Cool. Back in. You guys gonna be happy Upstream, with that digital bud. shot? Upstream, bud. There you go. You ready? Yep. Guiding for me is a great opportunity to meet many different personalities from all across the country, sometimes the world. It's a, a chance for me to show them where I live and what we have out here out west in the United States. Um, it's a great, great opportunity for me to see the smiles on their face when they hook into a big fish or see a father and son combo or husband and wife out here catching fish, just having a good time together, experiencing something, making memories. Um, I get out here, I, I teach them, sometimes I teach them how to fish. Oftentimes we get novice fishermen out here, other times we have men who've been doing this for 60 years. So you get a wide range of it and depending on their skill level that also determines how active I am in, in the role. What happens, you get a lot of people out here and this might be their one trip each year or maybe they get two or three trips each year, but probably for the most part they've been stuck in the office in the city or they've just been working and they haven't had time to get that rod out so they are quite rusty and they do need that opportunity and the best time to do that is not when you first get on the water and so you, you miss your fish. The best time to do that, do that is the night before, the week before is even better. You know, work out the mends, you're, you stop your rod tip, be patient with that, work on your mending. Anytime you can, keep practicing. If you don't, your skills will slowly deteriorate. One technique to help bring trout to the surface is to jiggle your fly rod in order to impart a slight dance on your fly. Basically, you want your hopper pattern to look like a struggling grasshopper. In fact, if you watch grasshoppers who have fallen in the water, you will realize they usually do a short stroke unless they're on their side. The key is not to put too much action on your pattern, but some will definitely help. My job with uh, Clacka Craft Drift Boats is I'm the national sales manager, and our headquarters is based here in Idaho Falls. Um, the boats are made in Clackamas, Oregon. That's where the name Clacka Craft comes from. The unique thing about drift boats uh, is everybody's had rafts throughout the country and used those, and typically drift boats or Mackenzie-style boats have been a western thing. Um, people come from the East Coast to come out and go on summer vacations to Idaho or Wyoming and Montana and they fish out of these funny looking boats. Well then they go back to New Jersey or New York or Virginia wherever they're from and they say well geez we could float our rivers and fish for smallmouth, we could float these rivers and fish for muskie and so they're finding that they give you great access, the boats are very durable, they last you a lifetime, they'll float in four inches of water, um, they're capable of handing class four and five whitewater in the hands of a competent rower, so they're just very versatile. We've also got a lot of people using them on still water because they're very wide bottom and flat and a great stable casting platform. The drift boat's a very unique boat. It's, uh, it can be used by any type of angler. Even the local guides here oftentimes have clients to come to fish Rapalas, uh, throw spoons and spinners, uh, so there's a lot of other people use them. Uh, bait fishermen use them in the Pacific Northwest for salmon and steelhead. Uh, very popular for bouncing bait and back trolling. The unique design features that Clacka Craft has over other boats is our hull. Um, in 1999, we come out with what's called a tunnel hull. It was used in shallow water boats, uh, flats boats on the, out on the coast. Uh, some jet boats had it. And it's a concave bottom on the back of the boat which allows water to flow smoothly and evenly underneath the boat. Um, as if you row back upstream, that water flows under the boat instead of hitting your transom and pushing you downstream. We have also have some tracking channels carved into the bottom of the boat and they fill with water and then that helps your boat track and, and go very straight and true. 
where on motor boats you'd have a keel sticking down below the bottom of the boat. These are carved up in instead of sticking down because for a shallow water boat you don't want anything hanging down below your bottom. That's like a pretty nice cutthroat. Yeah. It's acting like a real pretty cutthroat. I'm back out here a little bit so I can get a, get a net in so I don't crash. Yeah, I'd rather not crash. Whenever you're ready. Well. It's a cut. We can just get them in any time. There we go. And in the water. The nice thing to do is always get that hand wet before you start messing with those fish. Zach and I have been commercial fly tires since he was about 11 years old, so I don't mind leaving a fly in the fish every once in a while if it's a good thing to do. Uh, and. and Bless our cutthroats, it's a, a great thing, but cutthroats are a wimpy fish compared to other ones. They don't take a lot of mishandling. You, they, you can't grab them with a dry hand, you can't keep them out of the water and get a lot of photo ops because they just, they expire on you real quick. So you gotta be really careful with them. Fly lines are another thing that's kind of a controversy amongst anglers here. Uh, pretty much always, floating lines, and whether that be a double taper or a weight forward, uh, there's a lot of very, very good fly casters that are super fans of, of double tapers. I am one of them. Um, also kind of notoriously cheap, and you can use a double taper for a couple seasons, turn it around and use the other end. But we're fishing very close to the bank, as you have noticed here. Um, we're not casting very far, and so that double taper line's a good one. Nowadays, there's so many line companies that are coming up with, you know, bass tapers and clouser tapers and things like that. So we're getting an awful lot of choices. Uh, we do fish uh, streamers in the spring and the fall. And my favorite line for that's like a, uh, a Rio 200 grain or 300 grain, depending on the size of the rod I'm using. And, getting down and, and dredging. I like fishing, you know, if you get a good rower and he'll keep you a constant distance, there's a fish on, a uh, constant distance from shore, it's pretty nice. You just lay that fly line out there with your streamer and make a few pounces away and uh, pick it up and lay it right back in. Huh? Who's on that bead head that that guy tied? What was his name? Oh, that was you. Hey, now, that point. He's got a black tail like a bow. Really brown, thinking brown? brown? Oh, gets his head up at the brown. <laughs> oh, God, you gotta love gotta it. Gotta love it. Don't you love this game? It's a good fish, buddy. Oh. Stop him right here. Turn his head. And he's coming. Oh, <laughs> pig of a fish. Woo. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, yeah, that is a nice fish. Nice one, huh? Thank you, bud. Yeah, you bet. Well, we've just had a great day here on the South Fork of the Snake River. Some of the tactics we talked about can be used anywhere in North America, and they'd catch you fish. I hope you enjoyed today's show. See you next week.